In this episode of Code of Culture, we will see the ideas of a French Marxist anthropologist called Paul Meliasseux, who made his fieldwork in Africa in the 1960s. And we will use these ideas to see how the capitalism needs the open source, but at the same time it's killing it. Today, let's get Marxist in Code of Culture. In the episode about social classes in the open source, we discussed how there are some open source programmers hired for companies and others that need to contribute in their free time. One of the consequences of this was the log4j security vulnerability. This reveals how companies often rely on open source software but may not contribute back or pay their maintainers. This raises questions about the sustainability of open source projects and their supply chain. But this was not always like this. Let's see how we got here. In the past, companies had to write most of the code of their applications from scratch, which was time consuming and expensive. However, with the rise of open source software, companies now have a huge catalog of free, ready to use code and applications. For example, MySQL or PostgreSQL are popular open source databases that companies use instead of developing their own proprietary database system or pay for a proprietary one like Oracle. Similarly, companies frequently use open source JavaScript packages such as React, Vue, or Angular for building their web applications instead of creating their own from scratch. This makes the development process cheaper and faster. However, while some companies may contribute back to these open source projects, the vast majority of the code they use is free and without any compensation to the creators. As we said, this approach saves companies a lot of time and money, but it can also have a negative consequence for the sustainability of the open source projects and the people who create them. But why would a private company want to make this code open source? Actually, companies like Google ask this every day. Tim Hawking, one of the creators of Kubernetes, in the documentary about Kubernetes that's available in YouTube, tells the story that when they proposed to the CEO of Google to open source Kubernetes, the question that he received was, why? What do we get out from this? And this is the current conflict about capitalism and open source. It must give back something to the company that invests in it. Some companies have started to release open source version of their software applications, often referred to as community versions, as a marketing strategy. This is the case, for example, of Red Hat, MySQL, MongoDB, or Redis. By doing so, they can increase their brand recognition and establish a wider user base because people can try out the free version of their product and later upgrade to a professional one. This also lowers the feeling of vendor lock-in in users. They have a feeling that they can always get back to the open source version or adopt other compatible solution if the service gets too expensive the support is not as good as expected, or the company simply disappears. Companies can engage with a community of developers who can contribute to the project and help improve it over time. And sometimes, as in the case of Kubernetes, the motivation was to involve other companies in the development and create a standard for containers orchestration. And the market will be more prone to accept these if it is an open source standard. Now, it's clear that companies have reasons to invest in some open source project, but clearly not in all of them, as they need to find a payback in their expenses. Let's see how this affects the open source communities. Well, in the previous episode, we explored two different perspectives on open source. One as an egalitarian community based on common efforts and status, and the other one as a capitalist market where programmers sell their time and knowledge. 
In Marxist anthropology, we call this production modes. They are different ways of organizing social and economic relations around the production and distribution of goods and services. Claude Meliasseau, a Marxist anthropologist, studied in 1960s how capitalism uses different types of production modes to extract profit from rural workers. He saw this in Africa, where companies used workers from rural communities and when they were no longer able to work, they sent them back to their communities instead of offering social services or retirement benefits. When they were in the city, the workers were used in a capitalist mode to work in the factories. And later, in their hometown, the community take care of them when they were not able to work anymore in something that he called the domestic mode. He also claimed that the capitalism depends on the domestic mode to extract wealth from the workers by not paying them retirement or not offering proper health or social services. Many so called this the articulation of production modes. He also noted that this is similar to how capitalism uses illegal migrants in Western countries. They are often used for cheap labor and when they are no longer needed, they can be easily deported without receiving any social service or benefit. When we use these two lenses to explore the technology market, we can see how companies work on a capitalist mode and use the open source mode to create and maintain code that is not valuable for them. In a quite similar way, than the domestic mode in Mediasu takes care for free of the workers that cannot work anymore in capitalist factories. This highlights the complex and often contradictory relationship between open source and capitalism and raises an important question about the future of collaborative production in capitalist societies. In conclusion, we see that capitalist mode of production is using the open source mode of production to its advantage while also starving and relying on the goodwill and free time of most of maintainers in the wild. This tension between the two modes is reflected also in the tragedy of the commons and game theory. The tragedy of the commons refers to the idea that individuals acting in their own self-interest can collectively deplete a shared resource, even if it will affect all of them in the long term. In the context of open source, this means that companies may take advantage of open source software without contributing back to the community, ultimately hurting the long-term sustainability of the project and discouraging newcomers to enter the open source. The game theory, in the other hand, explores how individuals and groups make decisions when faced with strategic choices. In the context of open source, this means that companies may prioritize short-term gains over long-term benefits to the community because they don't want to be the only ones paying for something that everyone else is using for free. It's important to recognize these dynamics and work towards a solution that balances the interest of both the capitalist and the open source modes of production in order to create a more sustainable and equitable future for technology. Today we explore how capitalism and open source interact and we used Marxist anthropology to understand how capitalism needs but at the same time abuses the open source for its advantage. Thanks for watching this episode of Code of Culture about capitalism killing the open source.